output. And now you formally calculate what happens with this, if with this choice. So you do, this is a change of variables for the surface integral. And uh, if you do this formally, you finally uh, find out that, that in fact, what you want to measure up to this uh, coefficient gamma is the perimeter of y of e uh, with respect to y of omega. So this is the, uh, this is the um, deformed, uh, deformed uh, set e uh, where uh, we have just phase one. So this is like, uh, you look what's the perimeter of the, of the boundary of the, of the um, phase one in your, in your deformed uh, domain, y of omega. So in this particular case, we come up with the following model. So uh, we have a zeta, which is the, uh, which is the phase indicator in the deformed configuration. So in the Eulerian setting. And uh, then I have just two phases. So W0 and W1 as before. So these are the uh, uh, stored energy density of phase zero and one as before. And then, and then, we, def uh, then we come up with the following energy. So now this is the uh, phase indicator or volume fraction, if you want, of the, of the uh, phase uh, uh, one in the, in the uh, deformed configuration. So we compose it with y to get something x dependent. And then we have one minus the same object for w0. So this is the bulk contribution. And now we have the uh, interface con contribution, which is just gamma times the perimeter of the set where zeta equals uh, equals one in y of omega. So this is the this is the this is the um, Lagrange or Eulerian description of the model because this this has a Lagrangian part, uh, the bulk part, and the Eulerian, which is the interfacial one. Um, and then the phase field approximation is uh, is kind of natural. You simply get inspired by Modica Mortola approach. So you keep the bulk part as it is because there is nothing much to change. And then you take the interfacial, which is instead of having the perimeter, you simply integrate in y of omega uh, the the gradient of zeta and x y is the uh, Eulerian variable. And then you uh, add the one over epsilon some function phi of uh, the volume fraction zeta here, where uh, this function is zero if and only if you, the argument is zero or one, and otherwise is uh, otherwise is positive, and then the surface tension coefficient can be calculated using this formula, as in the classical Modica Mortola uh, approach, where you work say in reference configuration. Um, yeah, so that's the definition of the perimeter. And um, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the crucial thing is that if you, if you are working in the Eulerian coordinate, so the, uh, you start with the set of, of finite perimeter in your, in your reference um, uh, domain, but now you map it using the deformation Y to something. And it's not really clear whether the perimeter is, is, is finite because we are working in W1P, not, uh, so, so these are only uh, held the continuous function. So we have to take care of it. And then also we want to be, make sure that we are working on invertible maps and um, uh, homomorphisms. And to, to ensure this in a variational setting, we use the definition of the, the uh, finite and optimal distortion. So if you have a Sobolev map of this class, with a positive or zero determinant of loss everywhere in omega, we say that, uh, that this map is of finite distortion if determinant is locally integrable. And um, there is a function k, which is uh, smaller than infinity almost everywhere, such that the Hadamard inequality holds with this constant, uh, the, the, the opposite one, the opposite Hadamard inequality holds with this constant k. So then the optimal distortion Ky is defined like that, so it's a, it's a, uh, it's in C dimension. It's a gradient of y to the power of three divided by the determinant. If the determinant is non-zero, when we set it one, otherwise. And th that's very good on this function is that 
this function, if you map F to the distortion, then this is polyconvex on the set of matrices with positive determinants. So this is a term which you can, for example, include to your energy and doesn't spoil our semi-continuity. And uh, there is a result by Hansen Koskela from 2014, which says, if you have a, if you have a, a map Y in W1P for P bigger than the dimension in general, but here is three, and assume that the KY, the distortion is integrable with, uh, with uh, power bigger than two, then Y is either constant or open. So it's either a constant map or open map, which means it maps open set to open sets. And this allows now to de define the, um, the set of admissible deformation for our setting. So we will assume that our uh, uh, deformation lives in W1P for P bigger than three, the dimension. We assume positive determinant almost everywhere. We assume this inequality, which is known as CRL Nature's condition, which which tells us that um, uh, our uh, uh, deformation Y, I mean, these, these conditions together tell us that Y is, is injective almost everywhere. And then we still assume that the distortion is, is in LQ for Q bigger than two. So uh, the CRL NHS condition tells you that if you restrict Y to some omega minus little omega, where uh, little omega is a negligible set so that the mapping is injective, and um, and then we know that uh, the, the control of the distortion tells us that Y is open. Um, and uh, then it means it's also uh, injective everywhere in, in omega because it cannot be constant because the mapping is almost everywhere injective. So it has to be open. And from these facts, you can show that in fact, you have injectivity everywhere. So Y is continuous and Y of omega is open. And you also have that the inverse is continuous. So these are the qualities which we will need for our, um, for our um, results. So the result what we get here is the following. So Y omega is an open set. And then you take E a measurable set uh, and Y is, I mean, it will be enough, it will be just locally W13. So now P even decreases, it has to, it can be just the dimension. And uh, this, if this is a homomorphism of finite distortion, then, um, then the perimeter of the, of, the, uh, of the image of E uh, uh, is, uh, is finite if and only if there exists a rather measure PYE such that this holds for every test function with the compact support in omega. And the perimeter of the set can be calculated as a total variation of the measure. So the, if you do the formal calculation, you see that you exactly get what, uh, what you would expect from the, from the uh, theory developed by Shohavi, because here the divergence of the cofactor is zero. That's a, that's a well-known uh, uh, POS identity. So we just remain with this term here. So it's a, it's a formal calculation. So that's, that's uh, one result. So we were able to characterize the, the measures which appear on the, in, 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 in the result by Shohavi quite explicitly here. And then, um, yeah, and then we have the phase field approximation. So we, this is our uh, set of, of deformations. We assume that we have some uh, Dirichlet datum on the part of the boundary gamma zero. And then we have a volume fraction for the sharp interface. We assume it only takes zero one values in the different configuration. And then for the approximation, the phase field approximation, we assume we can also take some values in the middle as, as it is usually done. And then um, what we can show is that there is a minimizer to the sharp interface problem. There is a minimizer to the phase field approximation. So this always requires that in our set of admissible states and deformations, there is one element at least on which the functional is smaller than plus infinity. And uh, so that's, that's what we can prove. And the proof relies on uniform convergence of deformations because P is bigger than the dimension. So it implies that 
the the images of omega uh, in yk are somehow getting closer and closer to the image of the of the omega uh, mapped by y because because we have uniform convergence yeah then we also have a um, uh, we, we also have a, a convergence of of volume fraction so if you have a sequence of uh, of deformations and you know that the uh, Eulerian volume fractions are converging in some OK, which is the set where um, this is omega intersected with omega YK, because I mean, all of these are de defined on different sets and the set is moving. Then it also implies that the uh, Lagrangian volume fractions are going to zero. So, so, the, so there is this implication, which is important for proving the finally the, the gamma convergence results. So, the gamma convergence result says um, if you have a, uh, so there's a limb inf inequality. So uh, if you have uh, the sequence of phase field approximation, so then they, uh, then, uh, then there is a classical limb inf inequality of this form for the, for the um, perimeter of E of Y in omega Y and uh, we also have this uh, convergence of, of volume fractions, and this is limb inf inequality, the classical one. And for limb sup inequality, we are able to construct it only in case we know that the that the uh, deformed configuration is Lipschitz. So in particular, it means that we, for example, prescribe the boundary datum on the whole on the whole boundary, and then we say, okay, so the, the then this this comes somehow ensures that your that your uh, image is Lipschitz, and in this case we also have limb sub inequality. So I think I'm running a bit out of time. So let me wrap up a little bit. So we we explicitly characterize measures defined in the model with interfacial polyconvexity. At least, I mean, one term there. We show that admissible deformations are homomorphisms of finite distortion. And then we also have existence results for a diffuse interface model, which might perhaps bring easier numerics than the sharp interface model. And uh, the proofs are based on modica mortola approximation in the deformed configuration. And um, we have two papers on that. So the first one in ARMA, it's just two-phase model, and then the Second one in the Journal of Elasticity is uh, is for multiphase materials where there are some other conditions coming, like that the, that the say surface tension coefficients or the interface energies has to somehow be um, there are some uh, there are some relationships between just to make sure that there can be an interface and so on. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Um, are there comments or questions? Uh, yes, Paolo? No, it was a... a ah, you are just... Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, are there questions? Uh, so actually, uh, I have questions. Uh, I have two questions, but maybe I will have time only to ask one. Um, my first question is about this interfacial polyconvexity. So mm -hmm. assume um, that your functions W1 and W2 are convex functions of the gradient and forget about the determinant constraint. Okay. So in that case, it's easy to, to, to prove that the relaxation uh, of your, your energy density, of your, of your energy would be just the integral of the inf convolution between both uh, convex functions. And uh, my question is how in that case, in that simplified case, do you relate uh, the, and, and the computation of the inf convolution is explicit in general. If you give yourself two functions, you can compute the, the inf convolution. So my question is, in, is how do you relate this explicit relaxation to uh, your um, interfacial convexity in that case? And would it be possible to compute explicitly your, your variant, various measures which appear in the, your formulation? So, I mean, I, I think in this case, I mean, you we wouldn't have any interfacial polyconvexity because if you do relaxation, you would have a minimizer. 
right? And you would have a classic. You are a minimizer of the relaxation, but not of the original problem. You have a minimizer of the relaxation, but you have also that you have some sort of relaxation uh, properties, which means that your minimizing sequence uh, would kind of converge to the minimizer of the of the of the um, of the relaxed problem and so on. So. Um, because the point is that when you relax, you lose, you lose the two-phase problem in some sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, you know I, I think it might be that that uh, maybe if you take this uh, interfacial polyconvexity and and maybe you are kind of um, making the interfacial polyconvexity. The, the, I mean, uh, you scale it to zero, so somehow that you take a sequence of problems where the inter interfacial polyconvexity term would kind of go to zero, then I guess it might be a good uh, minimizing sequence for your original problem. Okay. Which somehow leads to the minimizer of your relaxed energy. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I would say, you know, you take simply the, uh, maybe we have it here. So you, you um, yeah. So I would say you, you simply have a sequence of problems when this interfacial energy term would go to zero and then, then I think this this might be a good approximation, I guess, of your relaxed um, relaxed uh, problem in terms of that this would give you a minimizing sequence for your relaxed problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>